name is Mr. Johnston. I'm the woodworking instructor here at Shawnee High School. Uh, today we are going to go through and we are going to give demonstrations on all the power tools that we have in the shop. Uh, we are going to go ahead and illustrate all the parts. We are going to go through and then demonstrate how to use these tools properly and safely in the shop. And that's about it I guess, right? Alright, um, today we're going to be going over the different parts of the table saw. Okay, this is our saw stop table saw. Um, and it is a special table saw. It is designed um, to help prevent injuries. Okay, there is an electric charge on the blade. And what the electric charge does, it sends a current throughout the blade so when flesh comes in contact with the blade, it actually um, current flows into your body, which deactivates or actually activates the brake mechanism. The brake mechanism shoots up into the saw blade and instantaneously lowers the blade also, so it helps to prevent injuries as well. Um, some of the parts of the saw stop table saw. elevating hand wheel. Okay, it adjusts the height of our blade. So we can raise it and lower it. On this side, all right, we have our tilting hand wheel. All right, so if we needed to make an angled cut, we can do that. Right here we have our push stick. We use our push stick for making cuts. Narrow, narrow cuts of anything less than five inches you can use a push stick for it, or you should use a push stick for it. Okay, right here we have our fence. Our fence lies along our track and locks into place. We use this for ripping. Uh, we can also use this for cross-cutting pieces that are wider than 12 inches. Um, our guard mechanism right, comes over the blade. Plate out. All right. You should also make sure the machine is off. We release this handle. Okay. Take the guard off, and then we could put our throat plate back in. The only time that we would do that is if we have to make any type of dado cut. But for cross cutting, for ripping, you want to make sure that the guard is in the saw. So right now I want to make a cut that's three inches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my fence to three inches. Okay, my fence has a ruler on it. I have a, uh, a red line at the ruler that indicates where I'm going to be making my cut. So as e it's as easy as saying I want to make a cut of three inches. I set my fence at three inches and then I can make my cut. You want to make sure that your fence is clear of any and all debris before you make your cut. Um, at this point, I've turned the machine on. I have a green solid light, so all I have to do is pull the paddle out and make my cut. <clears throat> now that the fence is clear of debris, I should identify the height of the saw blade. And right now, the height of the blade is a little bit too high. All right, the saw blade should be about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch above the workpiece. You don't want it too high. All right, if it's too high, there's more of a potential 
that you could cut yourself or have any clothing or material caught in the saw blade. I also identify my stock, making sure there's no nails or foreign objects in the stock. At this point, I'm going to stand to the left hand side of the saw blade. I'm going to turn the machine on. I'm going to hold the material tight to the fence with my left hand. My right hand is going to follow the material all the way past the blade. I'm going to complete my cut. You may have noticed that during the cut I use my push stick. Okay, my push stick is used for, like we said before, cutting stock that's less than five inches wide. Obviously the stock is less than five inches wide, so I use my push stick. It's safe. All right, I don't need to get my hand next to that blade. Okay, so we've made a ripping operation. Now we're going to make a cross cutting operation. In cross cutting, you want to make sure that the fence is out of the way. You want to make sure that you have your miter sled. Okay, this is your miter sled. It's used for cross cutting. Your miter sled slides okay, right along this track. It's locked in a place now. We've already adjusted the height of our blade. And the miter sled is as easy as holding the piece uh, of stock tight to the sled. Okay, you're going to use two hands. You're going to feed the material nice and slowly past the blade. So we'll turn this all on, we'll make our cut. Alright, if you noticed, uh, during my cut I stood to the left hand side, I waited for the machine to idle down, then I can go ahead and grab my stock and move it away from the blade. I did not do it while the machine was running. Okay, move our scrap piece out of the way. All right, and that's how we cross cut with the miter sled. Okay, you never want to grab a stock that's three inches wide and try and use the fence. Okay, what's going to happen if you do do that? You're going to wind up pushing the material through. Um, and once you have this material come off the fence in the corner, all right, that's when you have a potential for a kickback, and that's not safe. The only time you want to use the fence for cross-cutting is for cross-cutting pieces more than 12 inches wide, okay? Because with a piece that's 12 inches wide, it's easy for you to hold that stock tight up against the fence, all right? And, you know, you want to reduce the um, opportunities for kickback, all right? That's how we rip and that's how we cross cut with the table saw. All right, today we're gonna to go over the planer, okay? And what the planer does, the primary purpose is to reduce the thickness of a board, okay? You have a width of a board, you have a length of the board, and you have your thickness of a board, okay? So the planer reduces the thickness of the board. Uh, some of the parts of the planer, you have your on-off switch, you have your motor, okay? You have your table. Okay, this on the inside of the table is called the throat, okay? Um, that's actually where you're gonna be feeding your material through. You have your elevating and lowering hand wheel here. Over here, you have your clutch, okay? And two parts that you should be aware of, okay? This mechanism adjusts the uh, in-feed and out-feed rolls, okay? That's set for you already, that doesn't need to be touched. Uh, this over here adjusts the speed at which uh, the infeed rolls grab the board and pull the board through. Okay, this is set as a slow setting that doesn't need to be touched either. All right, the main thing you need to be aware about the planer is you have an infeed roll, you have an outfeed roll that you can't see. In between that, you have a cutter head. The cutter head has three different blades on it. Okay, it has a blade. Uh, divide it in three different quadrants around a cylinder. All right, and what that does is that spins at a high rate of RPMs, 
it chips off a very thin layer of the top of the piece and it feeds the board through. Okay, So it, it cuts the top hand side of that board that you run through this planer. Okay? The dust and debris gets sucked up through the ventilation system. All right, I'm not going to turn the ventilation system on just so that you can see and hear what's going on all right, as we use the machine. So, first thing we do is we're going to measure the thickness of the stock. This piece is an inch and an eighth. So I'm going to come down here, and I didn't mention this to you before. Okay, we talked about the hand wheel, but on this side over here we have our tape measure, and that tells us all right, the height of the table. So we're going to lower the table. To an inch and an eighth. All right. Once we have the table the same thickness as the board, we can begin to plane. All right. We want to make sure the board is clear of any uh, debris, foreign debris. Um, there may be some knots in here that break off during the process. There's not a whole lot you can do about that. But you do want to make sure that the board is free of any staples, uh, any nails or screws. So we have that set. We can turn the machine on uh, and start the plane. But one thing I Another thing that I want to talk about is this board all right, can plane up to a material of 18 inches wide. All right. You also want to make sure that the board that you feed in here is at least 18 inches long. So this piece is at least 18 inches long. It's smaller than 18 inches wide, so we can use the planer on this. We'll turn the saw on and we'll make our cut. As we said before, we were going to make a mess. Uh, for the demonstration purposes, that's fine. Uh, normally, we'd have the dust ventilation system, and this stuff would get uh, pulled out. But we wanted to make sure you can he hear and see what's going on, so we didn't turn that on. This is the side that we planed. All right, we have a nice, smooth, and true surface. Okay, we are going to plane the other side, so we're going to flip the board over. We're going to rotate the hand wheel one full turn. And then we can turn the machine back on and begin the plane. We've now planed both sides of the material. Now we're going to check for thickness. We're right about an inch. Okay. Um, if we wanted to continue to plane, if we wanted to get this material to three quarters of an inch, we would just continue to rotate the hand wheel one turn, feed the board through, pull it out, rotate it again, and feed it through until we get to the desired thickness. But that's how you use the planer. Obviously, you never want to stick your hands on the inside of the machine. That's where the cutter heads is, are. That's where the rollers are. Once you feed the board through, you have to let the machine do the rest of the work. All right. Same principles as everything else. You want to make sure you have on no rings, uh, no jewelry. Long sleeves should be pulled up. Uh, no hair that dangles into the machine. Um, the other thing you want to make sure you do is you want to use all surfaces of the planer. You don't just want to continue to use the left-hand side of the planer. You want to use the left, middle, and right-hand side of the planer uh, to make sure that the blade doesn't just get dulled out in any one area. Um, that's the planer, and that's what it does. All right, we're going to now begin our presentation on the chop saw. Okay, the chop saw is our preferred saw for cross-cutting. Okay, not only does it cross-cut, but it creates miter cuts. A miter cut is any cut on an angle. Um, some of the parts of the chop saw, we have our fence, we have our blade, okay? This is a 12 inch chop saw because the diameter of the blade is 12 inches. Okay, uh, we have our fence here, table, okay?
okay? Um, these wooden uh, fences that we have okay, here and the wooden table that we have here, okay, are designed to be set back behind this fence, okay? So it's important that you know that. I mean, the main reason that we have this wooden fence here is so that you can uh, clamp stop blocks to those fences, okay? So you don't want to hold your material tight up against the wooden fence. You always want to make sure you hold your material tight up against um, the metal stationary fence, okay? Uh, this lever down here, um, you squeeze the trigger and you can adjust the angle on the chop saw. Primarily, all right, we cut at 90 degrees, all right, which is our square cut, and we also usually cut at 45 degrees. Those are the two primary cuts that we make in here. Um, like we said, make sure the fence is clear of any and all debris. Um, this yellow thing right here, all right, that's your, your throat plate, very similar to the table saw. So right now we're gonna make a, a cross cut on the chop saw. All right, we have our board. Okay, our board seven and a quarter inches wide, so the chop saw will be able to cut this. We're gonna hold our material tight up against our metal fence. Notice that there is a gap between the wooden fence, okay, and that's okay. Like we said, the wooden fence is just to be able to clamp a stop block up to the fence so that we can cut multiple cuts at the same length. So if you needed to create four legs to a table, you can do that using the stop block. But right now we're just doing a regular cross cut. Okay, notice that we it's a two-handed operation. We made sure our, our hand, my left hand, was outside of this center disc. We held the material tight to the fence. We turned on the throttle. We brought the saw down. Okay, we made the cut. Okay, and then we released the throttle and allowed the saw to make a complete stop before we raised it up. Okay, um, there is some scrap material that sometimes gets in there. Uh, inside the throat. So you want to make sure that you stop at the bottom, okay? If you don't and you release it, you can catch those pieces. Those pieces can fly up against the wall and come back and hit you. So, so try and avoid that, okay? Um, the last thing you want to do is grab a piece like this, okay? And notice that we have the grain going. This, and this is actually the lengthwise of the material, okay? You never want to rip with this tool. Okay, so if I were to hold the material with the grain like that, you never want to make a cut over here at the chop saw. It's not safe. Uh, the blade is not designed to uh, cut with the grain. Any rip, ripping operations, we will use the table saw for. So now I'm going to show you how to cut multiple pieces to the same length, and to do that. We're going to use a stop block and we're going to use our clamp. All right. We are going to create a cut that is 13 inches. So we're going to measure out 13 inches. We're going to use our parallel clamp to lock our stop block into place. And once we do that, we can make our cut. Now we should have two pieces that are okay. The exact same length. Alright, that is how to safely operate the chop saw and make cross cuts for your project. Now, we're going to discuss the, the two drill presses now. Alright, this drill press that we have over here is equipped with our drum sander, okay, for sanding the inside curves. Okay, we also have a um, block of wood 
um, a drum sander jig that's clamped to the table okay so that we can um, use our piece if we didn't have that you'd have to hand sand this up in the air all right it's much safer like this and um, that way you can make sure that when you're sanding you're sanding at a 90 degree angle and not or on a 45 degree angle okay so some of the parts we have our on off switch okay uh, this hand wheel elevates and lowers okay the drum it's locked into place right now okay you have your chuck and our chuck key is over here to take the drum sander out you would loosen the jaws of the chuck with the chuck key okay we'll turn over this side um, <clears throat> we have a scrap board underneath here always want to have a scrap piece to make sure you don't drill into the table you also want to have a scrap piece to make sure that when you drill through you don't have tear out on the back side okay I'll show you how to loosen the bit put the chuck key in the chuck we loosen the bit okay and we have some different bits here, we'll put a different bit in. There's a quarter inch Forstner bit, all right? It makes a square bottom um, at the bottom of your cut. Right, we'll put the bit in, we'll tighten down the chuck, we'll go to a different hole, we'll tighten that side down. We're pretty much ready to go, okay? Uh, this drill press is 110 volts, so as we said over there, we're gonna have to make sure that we hit the red button uh, at the switch to make sure that we can turn the machine on. Okay, all the, the yellow boxes do is they prevent uh, the tools from coming on when we turn the power on at the source. Okay, so that's what the boxes are for. So, when we have a piece this large, uh, we won't need to clamp this down because we should be able to hold this in our hand. We'll turn it on. We'll drill our hole nice and slow. And as you notice, we don't have any tear out on the back side because we had our scrap piece underneath. Okay. Um, this table can be uh, elevated and lowered. We have a handle in the back. Okay, we, lo we can loosen the handle. This is pretty much a two-person operation because it's a heavy table, and we can lower and raise the table. This drill press over here. All right, we have a hand lever over here. It just takes a little bit more time, but that's a one-person operation um, to adjust the table. Okay. Both drill presses are variable speed, so we can turn at a slower speed or at a higher speed, but for the most part, uh, they are set at a higher speed um, and pretty much just want to leave the settings there. We're not drilling anything too large in this class, so a high speed is where you want to make your cuts. Uh, never want to leave the chuck key in the chuck. Um, and the same safety procedures as, as always, making sure you have no jewelry on. Uh, long sleeves and hairs tied back. Okay, today we're going to go over the disc sander. Uh, some of the parts of the disc sander, we have our guard. All right, to loosen the guard, you're gonna loosen these two knobs and adjust it, okay? <clears throat> you should adjust the guard to about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch above the workpiece. Uh, we have our table. We have our disc, which rotates counterclockwise. Uh, one part you can't see on, on the top backhand side, um, we have our brake. Okay, you can use your finger to um, push the button in and slow the brake down. We have our ventilation system on the back side here. It's tough for you, so for you guys to see, but we have a, um, a valve that needs to be opened to make sure the debris comes out of the disc sander. Up top here we have our on-off switch, and this is 110 volts. So you got to make sure you hit the red button, okay, on the yellow box to turn it on. Okay, the disc sander is used for sanding exterior curves. Um, it's also used for sanding end, end grain or side grain. You never want to hold the material tight up against the, the face grain of the disc sander. Okay, 
Um, in the past, we had someone trying to sand a small block like this up against the disc sander. Not safe. Do not do that. Okay. How do we reduce the thickness of the board? We use the planer for that. Okay. The disc sander just sands side grain and end grain. Okay. We'll show you how to use it. We'll turn it on. We'll hold the material tight to the table. All right. It takes off a lot of material. You will notice okay, that it will create a circular effect or some rings on your project. So you need to make sure that you come back with a regular hand sander and sand that down. It does take off a lot of material, so be aware of that. Okay, you don't need to put a lot of force into doing this. The next thing you need to be aware of, as you're noticing, I was moving the material back and forth. Okay. Um, don't hold the material in one spot for an extended period of time. You're going to burn out the material and it's going to make much more sanding for you later on. Alright, our band saws are used for uh, making irregular cuts. They're also used for resawing. Okay. I have some some boards over here. Okay. Resawing is cutting a piece down the middle. Okay, on its edge to reduce the thickness of the board. Okay, and there's a couple reasons that we we do this. Number one the reason that we do this is so that we don't waste stock. Okay. We have this thick stock. All right, we want to make it thinner. So we rip it down the middle, or I'm sorry, we resaw it down the middle with the plane with the bandsaw. We take it to the planer, we plane it down, and then we have two pieces instead of one. Okay, uniform thickness, right? And we, we waste the minimal amount of stock as possible. So that's why we resaw. We also use the bandsaw for all right, cutting any type of curve. So if you have just a, a gradual curve that you, you have cut, you can come over and use the bandsaw for that. So, some of the parts of the bandsaw, all right, if you open this up, okay, obviously you have your on off switch over there, all right, the bandsaw has two large wheels that rotate clockwise. The diameter of the wheels is equal to the size of the bandsaw. 20 inch wheel means a 20 inch bandsaw. Okay. You have your blade that runs along the outside of the wheels and that's actually what makes your cut obviously. All right. You have your guard. All right. Your guard can be adjusted all right, depending on the thickness of the stock that you have. All right. We'll close these up. This larger brick bandsaw also has a break because it takes a long time for it to slow down. Alright, so the first thing you want to do when you come to the bandsaw, and I'll be resawing this piece, so okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the height of the guard by loosening the knob in the back. Right, we said we want to keep the guard anywhere from an eighth to a quarter inch above the workpiece. The less amount of blade that we have shown, obviously, the better. Okay. From here, we're going to turn the band saw, saw on. I'll show you how to make a resaw cut. When we get to the end of the cut, you're going to notice that my hands in the beginning will be in front of the piece. And then as my hands get closer to the blade, I'm going to grab the stock from the back and continue to all right, we have our line going right down the middle of our piece so we understand right, where we're going to be making our cut.
brake to slow down the blade because it takes a long time to slow down. We have two pieces that we resaw. All right, from here, then you take these pieces to the planer all right, and you give them a uniform thickness. Um, we use these saw these pieces for our knife caddy and woods one. Okay, these would be our sides and our end pieces. Uh, that's one use of the bandsaw. Uh, over here, I'll use the bandsaw for an irregular cut. We'll adjust the height of the guard, make sure it's locked into place. Then we can begin making our cut. stock out of the way. As you can see on this board, there will be some uh, sanding that is needed after a bandsaw cut. Okay. Um, a lot of the table saw cuts that we make uh, will be nice and clean. There shouldn't be a whole lot of sanding needed there, but certainly with the bandsaw, there will be some filing and sanding needed. Okay. That was an outside cut. If we had a cut that was shaped like this, with the point on the inside. Anytime you have a point, okay, with the bandsaw, you're not gonna be able to make that point come back and turn around. You have to make a relief cut. So that's what we'll do. out and we came on through and finished the other cut. All right, anytime you're cutting a large piece like this, uh, it's much more difficult to handle and maneuver than a smaller piece. Okay. Um, so we made that relief cut. We can back out of the piece. You never want to come back and back out of this long piece because you're going to wind up pulling the blade off the track. All right, and that's obviously not very safe. Okay. Um, so this is a bandsaw. Make sure you keep your hands to at least four inches outside of your cut line. Today we're going to operate the handheld router. Okay. First we'll go over some of the parts, and then we'll go over some safety. Okay. Um, first thing is whenever using any tool or changing any blades, you want to make sure that <coughs> right, your material and your tool is your tool is unplugged. Okay. So, uh, the first thing that we're going to notice is we're going to notice our tabletop, we're going to notice our router bit, this is our ball bearing on top, and it's very important that your ball bearing is always coming in contact with your work. Um, right here we have a, a hand lever. We're going to loosen the hand lever so that we can take the tabletop off. Okay. Also you'll notice on this side we're going to have to unplug this. It makes it a little bit easier to take the top off. So we're going to separate the two units. All right, and we're going to come back and we're going to actually take this router bit out. To do that, you have your a nut here and a nut here. You're going to loosen these two. All right, we're going to pull our router bit out, and we are going to put in, okay, this was a, uh, a cove router bit, so it cuts uh, a cove on the inside of the piece. This is just a simple round over. 
we're going to put a quarter inch round over in our router. You want to make sure at least half of an inch of this shank goes into the union. Okay, half inch, three quarters of an inch is fine. Okay, the one thing you don't want to do is, as you can see here, you don't want to make sure that, okay, um, this shank goes all the way into, all right, the nut, okay? You want to make sure that you loosen this a little bit, you at least have a quarter of an inch, just so that it's tightening down on the actual shank and not on uh, the metal router bit, okay? So, we'll come back, we'll tighten these up, hand tight, we'll come back with our wrenches, all right? Tighten that up, and that's all you need to do. You really don't need to, to crank down on it much more than that. All right, from there we're gonna come back. We're gonna put the tabletop unit back on. All right, and like I said before, you always wanna make sure that this ball bearing is gonna come in contact with your workpiece. So, we'll tighten this down, and then we'll double check to make sure that that's gonna happen. You can hold your workpiece flat on the table, all right, and as you can see there, the ball bearing will come in contact, so that's going to work out for us. Uh, at this point, we have our material clamped down. We always want to make sure that we route the end grain first and then the side grain. And the reason is, is your grain is going to run your lengthwise of your board. As you route this piece and start to come over to the side this way, okay, uh, a lot of the times what happens is there's tear out on this edge of the piece. All right, If there is tear out there, when you come and route the side grain, uh, you should cut the rest of that tear out out. And, and your piece should look much better if you route it that way. Okay. So we're going to come back. Our router is already set. We're going to plug it in. We're going to plug it into here also. Okay. Now the router is a two-handed tool, so you want to make sure you have one hand, okay, on the handle here and one hand on the handle here. Okay. Your your piece is supported by a clamp. All right. It's nice and tight. It's not moving. All right. So you should be nice and safe in that regard. All right, the other thing you want to do is just make sure that your cord is out of the way. All right, from time to time you can, um, or people will nick the cord. All right, so make sure that your cord is, is safely out of the way and you can begin to route. All right, we're going to start uh, by making sure that the bit is away from your piece of wood. We're slowly going to move the bit in. It's going to, the ball bearing is going to come in contact with your wood, okay, and then you're just going to run the router bit right along the edge. And there you have a nice detailed edge that you put on your board. Okay, uh, I do suggest as you make your cut, you go nice and slow. You can go back and forth to make sure it, it cuts everything cleanly and properly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one thing I do notice that people do, if you don't have a nice clean edge that's pre-cut, all right, if the edge is jagged, you got to remember that that ball bearing is going to run along that edge. Okay, so if your cut is wavy, um, then your actual, uh, your route is going to be wavy. So make sure you have a nice clean edge, okay, before you begin to route. And there you have the router. All right, today we're going to begin to discuss the, the, the router table, okay. Um, we're going to go through some of the parts. The primary use of the router table is to do our raised panel doors 
all right, for our Woods 4 class, okay? Um, we're gonna go over it now so you have an idea of how to use it, but sometimes we do use it in, in Woods 2 um, for our single door raised panel door cabinet, okay? So that's the reason why we're gonna go over it, okay? Um, as you can see on the inside, we have a regular router, okay? Uh, you can see the router bit, okay? The router bit has a half inch shank instead of a regular quarter inch shank on the handheld uh, portable router, okay? So that's the reason why we use the router table. You have a, a bigger bit, you have a bigger shank, all right? Um, it spins at a high rate of speed, so you wouldn't want to use this half inch bit in a handheld router, okay? So that's the reason why we use the router table. Okay. Uh, when using it, this door should be closed. Okay. Uh, this vent should be open so that we can uh, suck the sawdust out. We have our on-off switch here. Our table is set. Okay. Uh, if we're going to be doing a raised panel door in this, okay, I will set up all this for you. Okay, and then we'll instruct you how to make your cuts. Okay. But you do need to understand that. Uh, the fence needs to be stationary, okay? We have a guard that sits on top of the router bit to make sure that your piece is held down and also so that you don't come in contact with it. I'm gonna make one cut for you now to show you how to use the tool. All right, I do feel like the handheld router is a safer tool. That's the reason why we use it more often in the shop. <clears throat> Although this does have a, a very good function for doing the race panel doors, and that's why we do it. Okay, so I'll show you how to make the cut right now. <clears throat> right now we're plugged in, we're set, we're ready to go. Our fence is stationary and locked into place. We're gonna turn our switch on, we're gonna hold our material tight to the fence and run it all the way through, okay? If I had a narrow stock, I would use a push stick. All right, this stock is wide enough where I can keep, keep my hands at least three or four inches away from the router bit and be nice and safe. Now, the other thing you want to remember is, like we said, we're using this bit for a, a raised panel operation, so it's not a really decorative bit. Um, but, uh, like I said, we'll show you how to use it with this bit on. So, we'll turn it on and get started. As you can see, uh, the router bit that we have in there right now just created a channel on the back side. Okay, but this tool is as easy as holding the piece tight to the fence and running it through, okay, much like you would use the table saw. All right, this is our lathe. Um, it's used for turning round objects, okay, if you wanted to make um, a round mallet, if you wanted to make a bowl, uh, if you wanted to make um, a dish if you wanted to make uh, a candle holder, all right? Any type of round object uh, is turned on the lathe, okay? Um, parts of the lathe, we have our guard up here, which lowers into place when you're gonna be turning. You have your headstock, which holds the um, one end of the piece in tight to your machine. On the other end, we have our tailstock, which holds uh, the back side of your piece tight in so that when you're turning the material doesn't come off. Okay, We have our tool rest. Our tool rest adjusts up and down. And then we have our lever here which adjusts side to side. Okay, um, So that when you're turning all right, a long piece you can move the tool rest. Um, everything moves on this except for the headstock. The headstock stationary everything else will move. We have our on off switch down here. We have our uh, speed adjustment over here. You need to make sure that the machine is on before you adjust the speed. Okay. When you start out, you're going to have a square block of wood. Okay. You want to make sure that your material is on here. Um, 
and you want to make sure that it doesn't wobble so you have to center up your piece all right before you put it on here if it's if your piece isn't in the center of the headstock and the tailstock your piece is really going to wobble okay but you want to turn this at a slow speed to start all right once you get your object round you can begin to start turning it at a faster speed Okay, we have a variety of tools, okay, this is our gouge, okay, this tool, if you were to have your stock on here, uh, your stock would be spinning between the headstock and the tailstock, and you want to hold your tool tight to the tool rest with two hands, okay, and you're going to move your tool back and forth to create the cut that you want, okay. The gouge is for rough shaping. Okay. Other tools that we have, um, there's a smaller gouge, used for the same purposes. All right, this is your parting tool, which we'll use to cut into your material. All right, we have a large skew, which can be used for rounding the outside of an object. Uh, we also will use this for any type of detailed sanding. We can use this to cut into the piece, create a nice smooth shape, okay? Those are the majority of our tools. Now, after we finish our turning on here, at that point you're going to want to remove the tool rest. All right, the tool rest comes out, we'll move it out of the way. All right, at this, speed, at this time you'll already be turning at a higher speed. Then you can really come back with your sandpaper and you can sand the material directly on the lathe. All right, just like normal sanding, you start off with a lower grit sandpaper, you move your way to a higher grit, okay? And then to finish, okay, you can use a 220 grit, grit sandpaper. You can also use, uh, some people like to use sawdust, all right? Some old sawdust that you may have from your turning, all right? And that will give it a nice polish um, you can also use um, uh, Brillo pad and that will give it a, um, a nice fine sanding as the last um, bit of sanding that you're going to be doing. Okay, So th this is the lathe like we said and it's used for any type of turnings.